Welcome to Table Talk and today with Fumi and I we are uh, joined by a good friend Kim here and we're going to be talking about a really sensitive issue and that is being a Christian and living with dementia. So I want to just uh, start off by saying I'm, I'm no expert in this field uh, in any shape or form. I have had some experience with working in a care unit in Scotland where people had uh, dementia and uh, you know it's, it's I, in my experience I find it really difficult to understand why it's why it happens the science behind it uh, I do know for for a lot of people that it more affects the family those who haven't got it than those who have got dementia uh, and it's like I said it's not an easy topic to talk about Never mind uh, <coughs> trying to bring it all together where God fits into all this question. So, have you got any experience with that? Um, <coughs> and working as a pharmacist um, in different aspects in hospital, I have worked as a pharmacist on a dementia ward as part of my wards, uh, my ward visits, and it's it's interesting to see from our point of view, seeing the patient, or the patient's point of view, seeing people. It's, it's, it's like they are, there's a glass and they are watching and you're watching them because their realm is completely different. There are different, obviously, degrees to dementia, different yeah. types of dementia. I know a lot of people talk about Alzheimer's, but that's not the only type of dementia. Um, but the, the early part can be quite difficult for patients, um, people, so you should say patients because they're people, for people to have dementia because you know there's something wrong or you're not quite sure what it is. Um, those with full blown dementia in their own world, in their own space, and they, as far as they're concerned, their world is as real as your world is here now, or our world is. Um, and whatever time zone they are um, in the past is real to them, um, even though we in, in our time frame cannot comprehend what they're going through. And I think that the pain is for those who are watching on and having to deal with looking after them yeah. um, and caring for them um, and it's it's more difficult if you've got somebody who's got dementia and has got other health physical health issues as well that that can be tasking as well i was i was saying to to you hello wasn't I, that yeah that in my experience that when people begin to show signs of dementia you, you can tell they're frustrated but they don't know what's wrong uh, and so it's, it's almost like it's better when it goes full blown because that frustration is gone but like you said the, the, the difficulty is, is, is in for those who are mm -hmm. looking. Now you mentioned earlier that you were, uh, was it your father? My father had it, my mum's, my, my dad passed away with it, my mother's got it now. Um, I mean what you said for me, I think this idea of glass between you and them it is, it's a barrier that you don't see and it's, it's extremely hard to empathise because you don't know how the person is thinking. And this idea, like of it being full blown, our experience is that it, it varies every day. You don't know what you're getting up to and I think this is, this is the biggest challenge. Every morning you don't know what you're going to get. I think by the end of the day, sorry, by the end of the day, you know where you are with the person, but it's it's, it's a challenge to be able to empathise and to relate to the person. I, I know when, when I worked in, in the, the, like you said, there's varying levels, mm. and I, I've I've seen it where people have been the nicest, placid people, and all of a sudden they turn to really nasty, and I've seen really people who are really nasty turn into really nice, pleasant uh, people. And I, you know, I, can't, I can't explain, I don't know how all that works. But I remember one, one, one story, 
uh, when when I worked in a uh, care home in Scotland, I used to go to this lady and get her up for breakfast and things like that. And she'd always have a smile on her face and she'd always say, uh, I'm, I'm off on a world cruise today. Every single morning she'd say the same thing. And then you'd take her, she'd have her breakfast and things like that. And, and then at the end of the night when you put her back to bed, she'd say, have a wonderful cruise. Have a wonderful cruise. I can't wait till tomorrow to have another one. It was heartbreaking. And, and, and one of the, the biggest heartbreaks for me in my experience again was in another home where I went through the, the lounge area where the people, the residents were watching TV and it was time for dinner so I took her through and sat her down getting ready for dinner and then I went to get another resident to get into and the time I went back through the first lady was crying and, and I couldn't understand why so I was like, are you okay? What's happened? She said, I forgot to say thank you. Mm. And, and I thought in that environment, is a, it's a beautiful place to be a Christian where you're not expecting any thanks or anything. But that one moment really struck me. Mm. With, with, like, see, it's, it's almost like to go in and out of consciousness. Yeah. I don't want to use the word consciousness, but yeah. reality type thing. There isn't a stability. You know? yeah. I think the word in and out is exactly right. Mm. You don't know what you're going to face. I think, I mean, we kind of feel like we've been through a lot of it, but just with two people, that's two people, and that's not, if you read the books, it's very hard to generalise. You can't say, this is the way it will be. And I think it depends on your previous, previous relationship to somebody. Um, and if you read most of the books on dementia, they talk about a, a child looking after their parent who has dementia or Alzheimer's and they had very good relationships. And I think if you didn't have such a good relationship, then it's more difficult mm. to handle. Um, but I think, from what we experience, this seems to be, you talked about people being different, very aggressive or very quiet. I think it's some inherent personality that's coming out. Um, I'm not sure that it's change of a person that there's something in the way that they're upbringing that will come out in certain situations. Something will spark it. So, just to bring it a little bit closer to home for yourself, because you're living with that right now. Not, not you, but your, your mum. Mm -hmm. And you and your wife Anna are looking after your mum on a 24-7 basis. Now, I can only, like I said earlier, I can't even begin to imagine what's that like. Because working in that environment, you go to work, you come home, you switch off. Mm. But it's not so easy to switch off if you're yeah, living in that situation 24 hours a day. You find a way to switch off and that inevitably causes a stress because the person thinks they're being... Certainly my mother, if my wife goes into a room, she does teaching online, so she's doing work in another room, I will tend to go and do studies. Bible study or whatever on my own. So we tend to, in some ways, we leave her on our own too much, and that's that makes us feel guilty. But um, in fact, Anne talked to I think the GP and was saying the trouble is if we sit with her all day, we just we go up the wall because you're getting the same questions all the time, and it becomes quite irritating. It's very hard not to respond, so you tend to avoid too much contact and the trouble is they're then sitting on their own and that they get into their little maudlin and so how, how, how did uh, your mum get diagnosed was it has that been a, over a period of time or yeah um, I think we after my dad passed away we started to notice when we visited her that she would ask the same question a lot and it would be within the space of five minutes you get the same question and you give an answer. And so we were beginning to learn you just got to answer the question again. Mm. It's very it's very easy to try and not answer the question. But that's what they want, they want to hear the answer. So we had that and then uh, we were living 250 miles away and we had a phone call one day that she'd been admitted to hospital. Now this, this this reminds me, you said that 
sometimes dementia or Alzheimer's comes with something else. And there are physical things that are aligned to dementia. Um, so urinary problems, because they don't tend to go to the toilet enough. So they tend to get infections and they get bladder problems. So we had, uh, and my mother had, um, she's got vascular dementia, so that's also affected by the heart as well. We had a phone call from a friend of hers who goes up every day and she still goes up. And she, we were told she's been admitted to hospital um, she'd fainted and the ambulance came to the hospital. So this was at the start of COVID. So that's how I kind of time it. It was right at the beginning of COVID. So I came up, we were living in Wales. My mum was in Yorkshire. We drove up. I drove up on my own, stayed in the house, tried to go to the hospital. I, yeah, I didn't understand what was happening in hospitals with the COVID. And I went to visit and they said, no, you can't come in. So that was a challenge and so I stayed at the house and I had a phone call to ring the hospital so I rang the hospital and they said your mother's here she's ready to be discharged but we need to be sure that she's got full-time care because she's too confused so we can't let her out well, it sounds like you at a prison but we can't discharge her we can't discharge her from hospital unless we know that she's got full-time care. So I spoke to my wife uh, and we said, and, and our personal situation was such that we were able to, to say yes, okay. So we said, we will move up and we will care for her on a full-time basis. And that was pretty much of a formal agreement because I had to talk to the social workers and they wouldn't let my mother out until that happened. So uh, I remember going in to pick her up and she was, because of COVID, I had to wait in the reception downstairs and they, they brought her down and she was giving everybody a hug and saying, thank you very much, I've had a lovely holiday. She thought she'd been on holiday. Oh. And then when I was driving her back, she was telling me all the places she'd been, which wasn't the case. Um, we drove past a particular restaurant. Oh, they took me there when I was on holiday. So that's how we, we ended up being being with her. So how, how, how did you process all that? I mean, it, it's one thing to say somebody's got dementia, but on, on a personal level, seeing your mum, how, how do you process that in your, in your mind? Or? I don't think you do. Um, how did we handle it? I think our faith was very crucial to it. Uh, as Christians, we're told that we should look after our parents. Um, that's one of the key commands we get in the Old Testament, that that's our jobs. And my wife and I felt that she had that need. And the alternative was would be to put her into a home. And when my father was dying, we were there the day he died, um, both my wife and myself made a promise to my father that we would look after my mother if she ever needed it. So we'd made a, we'd made a promise and we, we felt that was a commitment that we couldn't avoid. I think the processing came later. It, it was a forced situation. Um, I think the Lord puts you into situations for reasons. And as I said to you, our, our personal circumstances were such that it just seemed to, it, it fitted. My daughter says fat, it fat. Yeah. Um, it, it did seem to fit. I don't know why. It, it just felt that this was the right next step to take. And you know, the Psalms say that um, the Lord will guide your steps. I think it's Psalm 119, I think. But God, or David says, guide my steps and my footpath. Did you ever, or anybody in the family ask why? Why is this happening? Or why now? Or I know you said it seems to fit. Or was why, why ever a question? Mm. No, I think we tried to rationalise it without saying why. Mm. I think um, 
as Christians, we tend to become, what's the word I would use? Accepting the situations. We might not like them, but we have to say there's a reason for this. And certainly my wife is excellent at looking at that and uh, finding the reasons and telling me all the time, you know, I think you, you post some things that she always forwards on to the family WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. And I think this idea that we, things happen for reasons and we have to face them. Let me ask you a question, because this came up on our tabletop we had a couple of weeks ago. There would be those out there who are not Christians who would say to you and to us, if God is such a loving, caring God, then why is he letting this happen to you, Mum? I think it's, um, you know, if you, if you smoke and you get cancer, you can't then blame God. And I think with things like dementia, we don't understand the physical reasons that a thing like this happens, but it's a lifestyle, things happen in life. Um, I think, for example, with my mother, one of her weaknesses, if I'll put it that way, was that she was, she was a workaholic, a tidyholic. She was almost compulsive tidy disorder. I, when I was growing up as a child, I found that very difficult. She had to have everything the right way, but she could never sit down and read or do a game or do a puzzle. And I think in some ways that you get it's, it's not God, it's you, that you've developed yourself and your way of thinking and it will affect you later. And I think that's why there is a motivation for looking after our minds and looking after our bodies as Christians. Now that doesn't mean that even if we do the best that we're not going to get something nasty happen to us. We are, we are animals. I don't mean that in a horror, you know, like we're aggressive. We are we are a we are a function of a sinful world I mean people will say the world is not perfect no it was God made it perfect yeah. so 6,000 years ago whatever it was in the Garden of Eden you know, I, I believe profoundly that this was real I don't go for this stuff that Adam and Eve didn't exist and they were just a metaphor for different Mm -hmm. you know, monkeys or some stupid idea. There was an Adam and there was an Eve. And science is beginning to prove that. And they chose to sin. God had said, don't do this. They did it. And with that, the whole creation that God had made was thrown into chaos. And I think if you look at the Garden of Eden and the way it is set up, we don't know, but they, they might have lived forever. I mean, there was no thought of death at that time. So in the Garden of Eden at the beginning, I don't think there was any death. There was no illness, there was no sickness. No. Uh, we were not killing animals to eat. So um, there was complete vegetarianism. And so God created a perfect world that man ma managed to mess up. And unfortunately, man continues to mess the world up. So it's almost like a, well not just dementia, but any kind of ailment, we spoke about this as well, that, you know, Christians are not immune to anything. Uh, but a lot of the, the, the pain and suffering that goes on in the world is due to our, our own doing, mankind's own doing. Uh, you know, and the, well, let me ask you this question. If, if, if somebody's watching this right now who's, whose parents are showing symptoms or in a similar situation to you when you're looking after somebody close to you with dementia, what, what advice would you give to them? There's two, I think. You've, you've got to go ahead in love and that's love of, uh, as a Christian I would say love of God and Jesus, but if we put that to a side, if someone is not a Christian, is love of that person and love of yourself. And you're not going to help that person if you don't love yourself. Um, I think I mentioned to you, our GP said to us that you know, you've got to look after yourself because if you don't, you're not going to be in a situation to help that person. So you've got to make sure that you're able 
to to handle the situation. Um, and I think it's it's probably a good experience. I think you know we talk about anger management and things, and I, I'm I'm sure dealing with dementia is a very good ang anger management course because you, whereas if if a person was saying things and they didn't have dementia, you'd probably end up with a fight with them, you know, and mm -hmm. um, you'd be answering back. I mean, as a Christian, I was brought up not to do that to my parents. But, you know, you'd be fighting. You'd be getting quite aggressive. Um, but when you realise this person is not conscious of what they're saying... Do you, you think, do you think this... Sorry, let me to interrupt. Do you think this has helped you to, would you say, grow and mature in, in your faith? You know, we know that everybody goes through difficulties, trials, problems, ailments, whatever it may be, um, no job, whatever it is. Um, but with a Christian, we we learn um, that the, diff the trials that we go through refine us or purify us and helps us to see whether our faith is genuine and are we trusting God to lead us and to help us through by the Spirit. Do you find that this, you said that it, you know, having your faith has helped, do you find that it's made you stronger in your faith, you've grown more mature if you look back in you know, the last 10 years to now, has, I, has this situation helped or hindered? I think um, yes and no. I think there are times that I look at it and think, yes, I'm growing stronger. Um, I've been motivated to move my website along, which is publishing biblical material. But I also sometimes feel it's two, te two steps forwards and five steps back. And sometimes I do get very despondent. I feel oh, I've let myself down. Something, you know, you'll go and do something that you shouldn't. Um, eat the wrong kind of foods drink the wrong kind of drinks, just get silly or whatever, and it's a way of you telling yourself, I can, this is the way for the handle. Now, a mature Christian would just trust completely in God. So I don't feel I've been as mature as I should have been. So I, I, I don't like myself for some of the things I do. You, you mentioned earlier uh, about guilt. Uh, does that come into the aspect as well where your mum says something, but it's almost like you're saying it's not your mum speaking, if that makes sense. She's speaking, but you understand? And so, you talked about guilt earlier, that you couldn't put her in a home because of the guilt of the night, that. But you know, we're looking after your mum on a 24 7. So, for example, you say you go fishing. I know you love fishing mm -hmm. uh, to get a bit of time out. Do you feel guilty doing that sometimes, or...? or yeah, um, not to my mother, well not for my mother, for my wife. Yeah. Um, because we do, we're in it together. I mean, it's, it's not her mother, it's my mother. Um, I know why, I mean, it makes me know why I married her and why as a Christian girl she was brilliant and she's still a Christian lady and she's fantastic. Um, that's where my guilt lies, is with, I shouldn't need to go away and I should do more for her um, but as I said we both really acknowledge that we do need to look after ourselves and it is very hard sometimes to balance the selfishness that you need I think um, as Christians we're taught not to be selfish and not think of ourselves but in this situation I think we have to a little bit I think, so I was going to say, in terms of the selfishness, I've said the opposite. I know that selfishness shouldn't be a part of the Christian's vocabulary, but ultimately, at the end of the day, when it comes to our salvation, and me being saved, then I'm selfish. Because I want to make sure that I get saved, type thing in that sense. Uh, so it's not not in a, a, an evil sense, but in a, and, and, and looking after it, because it, it really is like you say, it's about, you have to look after yourself. So, you, you know, you can talk to any amount of people about all different types of things, but, you know, if we don't study the Bible for ourselves, then we could easily be led astray. And that, to me, is one of the reasons why Paul talks about work out your salvation. 
the fear in Shemlet, so that we could, we're looking at that and, and because, like I said, to, to me it is kind of selfish, I'm looking after me, my soul, uh, and that's well, and, and you too. mentioned Paul, even Paul says that, because he talks about, I will buffet my body. Yes. And then he says, in case I, having brought so many of you to Christ, should fail myself. And if someone like Paul is fearful that he was going to fail at the end of the day, it just someone like me, it just makes me feel, you know, Paul compared with me. I mean, he was, he was taken to, well, we don't know exactly, but we assume he was taken to some heaven. He had an experience, he didn't know, he didn't know himself if it was in the body or out of the body. And so he still, having had that, if most people had had that, they would think, well, I'm, I'm saved, I don't need to worry. But Paul kept on going, and he kept saying, I've got to keep going. We tend to forget that Jesus too, took time out. He always had a busy day from dawn to dusk, but he managed to take time out. He needed to take time out. It was important to spend time with his father, to spend time away from I people. Think that's exactly he even right. taught the disciples. They'd gone away, come back from you know healing people and excited about it, and Jesus took them aside so that they could have some rest. Um, our bodies are not made to work 24-7. No. Our minds, even though your mind is, even when you sleep and your mind is still functioning, it's still functioning at a low key level because your body needs to regenerate. And if you are caring for somebody, then it's twofold. For them to have a decent amount of care from you, you need to be in the state of mind and health to be able to do it. And you cannot look after somebody 24 seven. You have to have a little bit of time off. Um, and, and nobody should feel guilty for having time off to recuperate. The second greatest command, love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. How can you know how to love your neighbor if you cannot love yourself? Yeah. How can you know how to care for somebody if you don't care for yourself and you know that I need to take time out to recuperate, to regenerate, to rest so that I can come back and be more fresh? Um, I think we tend to be hard on ourselves than we should be, than God would want us to be. And I think you, um, I think you really hit the nail on the head. You talked to about Paul. Uh, no, you didn't. You talked about Jesus, and he he would take himself off to pray. And I think, for the Christian in a difficult situation, prayer becomes essential. Mm. Um, it's something we should not let slip. It's very easy to not pray when we should do. But what did Paul say? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So we're not. Paul wasn't saying I can do all things. Is Christ in me that does everything? Um. But you, you, know, you mentioned earlier that you, you feel blessed that God has put you in a position to look after your mom, you, you and I. And I, I firmly believe that as well, that, that God puts the right people in your life at the right time, regardless. Because the, the reason I asked the pain and suffering question as well is, as people look at all the negative, but you, you never you never hear anybody saying, well, thank God for the NHS. Thank God for the surgeons who saved my mum's life. Thank God for, for medicines mm -hmm. that, that's been discovered and, 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 and used to, to, to save thousands and thousands of lives. Uh, and, and I truly believe, again, like, like you said, that, that things happen in life and we may not fully understand them, but if we look close enough, we'll see that God has put people there to help us with those certain circumstances. And it's no accident, it's not a coincidence uh, that that you find yourselves in, in, in that position, mm -hmm. as hard as it is. And, and don't get me wrong, I can't, like I said earlier, I can't even begin to imagine what you guys are going through. I can't even begin to imagine how tired and exhausting it must be day in, day out. But I can, and I'm sure like for me, as 
is inspired and encouraged by the way you guys cope with this. Because we're on the outside well, looking in, and I know you, you can say, well, it's faith and that's what we're supposed to do, and blah, blah, that, that sort of stuff. And I get that and I understand that. But for people looking in, I guess what Chat say is that you, you don't necessarily see the impact of you looking after your mum actually does in the wider community within the church. Mm, that's nice of you to say. I think, um, well, I mean, it, it sounds a bit weird having you said that, but you you strengthen us. I see you, you strengthen Annie, you strengthen me. I, what you post, what you say, what you do. Um, having someone to look at and say, that's, that's the kind of Christian life. I was saying to Annie, um, there was someone that people here won't know, um, Shola. I was watching one of his recordings and I said to Annie, I just admire that man so much. He just is incredible. I said, that's someone I wish I could be like. I mean, he's just Christian to the full. Yeah, so when you say, I look at him and I think, well, compared to, I'm nothing to that guy. He is, I mean, he's an elder in the church and that's you know, a good thing to strive for. Um, we look to others to get our strength. In the same way that Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I think when you say through Christ, it's the church as well that we help each other to do the things. And I think that's one of the, a lot of people don't understand the concept of church. They think it's a building where it's the people. And if, according to what Paul says, we're the arms and the legs and the ears and the eyes, then that means we're supposed to do all the physical stuff in, the, in a spiritual church, if you wish. And that's where, to me, the church comes in as a family. Because I often hear people will say, Oh, God, help me, God, help me. And, and then, what does God do? He sends his people. Mm. But they don't recognise it as God's help. They don't, they don't recognise it, they don't understand it. And you think, well, you just cry for help, and this is God's way of doing it. Because he's not going to appear in the clouds or sing Gabriel or something like that, you know. He, he sends his people. And, you know, what you're saying there, when you're comparing yourself to, to somebody else, we could all do that. We could all compare to ourselves, kind of, and say, I, I, I know the... I know what you're saying, but what, what, what I'm saying in, in all of that is that I, I invented a saying, well, I think I invented it, I had it everywhere, <laughs> that I, that I asked the question, who encourages the encourager? Mm. And people used to, well, what do you mean by that? So well, you get people who, who just constantly, constantly encourage him, and you get people who are constantly, constantly serving, and people who are who are going through difficult times like yourself, and yet when you're going through it, you don't see that you're encouraging somebody else. You don't see that you're inspiring somebody else. And so others that come along, and, and they may watch this video in a year or two years time or whatever, like going through a similar scenario, may well be very much encouraged by what you're saying. And, and th those are the, Somebody who's honest enough and open enough to talk about it is, is, is half the battle, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and to bring, like I said, with the, with the Christian faith into the, the equation, how, how God gives us that strength to get through, is, uh, I, I think it's, it's shown itself over and over and over again. But I think I've said before that when Paul talks about that, the, that God will comfort us, and Jesus will comfort us. The word comfort there is not the, oh my, my, you're going to be okay. It's not that type. It actually means strengthened. Mm -hmm. So God gives us strength to get through these difficult times. And that's blatantly obvious to me. That's what he's doing with you and Anne. He's giving you the strength to get through that. But you've also wise enough to look around and say, there is different aspects out there where I can get encouragement. To, to help me keep going for another day. Because I'm a firm believer that our faith needs to be on a daily walk. Yeah. Not a weekly, not a monthly, a daily walk. And until we learn to strip our lives back as if we're not going to be here tomorrow, but I'm going to be faithful today as far as I can, then that, that's basically the reality of what you're living in right now. A day-to-day -day thing you can't think about tomorrow. You can't even think about the evening and... and 
I think um, that's very true. I think someone um, I look to quite often is Joshua, the um, in the Bible, Joshua. And when he was told, God said to him, strengthen your weak knees. Mm. And I think that's such a powerful expression. Because it was shortly after that that Joshua said, choose you this day who you, who you will serve. Mm -hmm. And But for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Mm. And I think you've got to have that constantly in your mind. Um, when we, we partake of the Lord's Supper on a Sunday, we will pray that that memory will stay with us in the coming week. Mm -hmm. So that that is the strength. We're looking to the cross and we're seeing what happened there. And the empty tomb. Yes. So Sorry, sure. yes. Yes. <laughs> Definitely. Yes. Yeah. Well, Ken, we want to thank you so much for, for talking with us and, and, and sharing your thoughts with us. And, and please know that unbeknown to you you'll be you'll be inspiring in other, other people because like i said uh, you're literally having to live one day at a time and take your your faith one day at a time you and i uh, you inspire us you encourage us and like i said before it's, it's one thing crying out for help it's another thing to accept the help that god brings along his people and uh if there's ever a time we can do anything then let us know if it's, if, if, if it's within our power we will we'll do that yeah, thank you. And, and I'll also say this to you as well the very fact that you've, you've decided you and I have decided to, to take care of your mum a lot of Christians would have just and a lot of people would have just put her in a home and sadly like I said from a home perspective working in a residential home what I found not in all cases, but in some cases, they're forgotten about. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, there was one guy who, who, who was a Church of Scotland minister, and I was caring for him. <coughs> and uh, I noticed that he was hardly getting any visitors. Yeah, I think he had a daughter or something that came in regular. And I said, how long did you serve the, the Church of Scotland? He says, that's somewhere like 55 years or something. I says, so you know a lot of people in the church then? He says, yeah. And I says, how, well, how come none of them come and visit you? Mm -hmm. and, and to me, that was... That, that, that was part of the, 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 the loneliness. When, when people are put in a care home, whether dementia or, or, or whatever, a lot of the time they're just forgotten about. Mm -hmm. And so again, like I said, I take my hat off to you, to, to you and Anne for saying, this is what we're committed to. And well, I think it is, idea. I mean, to be honest, it is a commitment as a Christian. It's not, it's not society's problem, it's not the NHS's problem, it's our problem. Um, so, you know, we need to realise as children of, of parents that we owe them a duty of responsibility. And the, the Bible tells us enough of that, and yeah, particularly in the Old Testament, that yeah. honour your father and your mother. And just as an aside, um, She's aunt's mom as well. Hmm. Maybe mother in law, but she's her mom as well. Yeah. I was taking her as a mom, and Caesar as her mom. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining with us. We hope we will catch you again very soon. Big thanks to Kim, thank and you. big thanks to Philly. Thank you. God bless. Bye. Thank Bye. you.